Hi, my name is Andy Lazur. I'm a water quality specialist with University of Maryland Extension, and I'm going to talk about landscaping septic systems. It's important to notice just some basics about the different types of septic systems and some of the considerations. What are some of the features of those systems uh, that you have to take into account in order to landscape? Then to talk a little bit about landscaping strategies and some tips and practices on how to landscape. So it's important to understand where your septic system is. Sometimes homeowners may not fully understand that, uh, particularly if you've just recently bought a home with a septic system uh, and you're really not sure. So you can contact your local county health department, typically the environmental health office. They make for the site plan, including a sketch that would help you determine exactly where that system is. If they don't have that on record, then you could hire a septic service provider to come out and actually uh, locate your system components, both the tank and your drain field. Another important consideration is that a drain field has a life expectancy of 30, approximately 30 years. And typically what happens over time is that the drain field soil gets clogged with organics and things like that and no longer functions. And so you can't repair it. You actually have to go to another area within your property to build a new drain field. And so that gives rise to what's called the repair area. So in your landscaping plan, you're going to want to take into account how to landscape your septic system, but then also how am I going to landscape the repair area that I will likely need several decades down the road. Now, conventional septic system is, is a very straightforward system relying on gravity. You have a septic tank here and then a distribution box, which distributes the wastewater evenly uh, over the soil in, in a number of trenches. The trenches tend to be several feet deep. The septic tank uh, may be also buried several feet deep and may or may not have these access ports dependent upon the age. Newer systems tend to have access ports that are with the lids right there at the ground surface. They're easy to locate and makes it a lot easier for the service provider, the pumper to come out and, and to pump the tank. But there's a lot of different types of drain fields. Here's the conventional gravel we just talked about. Here's another system where these chambers, these are basically a, um, a black plastic corrugated pipe that's roughly about three feet in diameter that's cut in half. It just basically replaces the gravel. Here's another system uh, where you have a black corrugated four inch pipe that's surrounded by artificial media, basically takes the place of the gravel, a lot easier to install. We have a sand mound here, which is just that, it's a mound, an elevated treatment system. And we have a very shallow placed drip dispersal system. And then we have, here's an innovative technology that uses uh, peat moss to filter and to treat the wastewater. And it sits over a gravel bed, which sits over a uh, good soil and the wastewater permeates down. This actually um, is above ground. So that's a, that's a feature there in that particular case that you'd have to take into account how to, how to landscape. Just a, another schematic of a sand bound system here, uh, which is basically an elevated with specialized sand, some gravel, the corrugated pipe here, but then it's also covered with topsoil uh, to allow for different types of vegetative growth to, to cover that. And then here's a drip system. And here what you basically have are these tubes that I showed you previously that are laid out, again, trying to distribute the wastewater evenly over the entire soil treatment surface. And these are typically placed about six to 12 inches below the surface of the soil. Then we have BAT units. Another term for BAT unit is advanced treatment unit, but in Maryland, we use the, the term best available technology. And you can see from this photo here that in this particular case, this unit has three access ports. And again, these access ports would be located at the soil surface. And these BAT units are basically 
uh, advanced treatment. They provide aeration to supply oxygen to the bacteria, which helps break down the organics. And one of the one of the advantages, not only in in getting better nutrient and organic treatment, is but that the effluent tends to be very clear compared to a typical septic tank effluent, and that actually uh, allows for, uh, in many cases, depending upon the soil, a smaller drain field area and potentially prolongs the life of the of the drain field because you're not putting as much organic material out there. So this is just a schematic of the process of how wastewater is treated. And again, it's taking advantage of the natural uh, biology of the soil, both bacteria and other types of organisms that are feeding on the organics, converting the nitrogen into different forms, but it's important to note that this process requires oxygen. And therefore we want our drain fields to essentially breathe. We do not want to cover them with any sort of structure or landscaping or mulch um, that would prevent the oxygen from flowing into the ground. It's very critical that these particular bacteria have the oxygen to remediate the nitrogen, break down the organics, et cetera. So looking at some of the systems, here's some examples of some of the features of different types of septic systems and, and therefore gives you an idea of, well, what, you, what do you have to deal with as far as trying to landscape the area? To break it up or maybe to sort of camouflage the, the system. And here's a BAT unit that has the three access ports, but also has this electrical supply post. And again, that presents an additional challenge than the access ports because you have something that's elevated, say two feet above the, the ground surface. Here's an interesting situation here where you actually have an elevated BAT and that's most likely because of the lay of the land and types of soils they had to go up um, to place this system. So again, not only do you have the access ports, but you do have this, but here's a sand mound here on the bottom left. And again, this could be several feet tall and um, the, this gets especially challenging when the sand mound is placed in the front yard because there's inadequate space or inadequate soils in the backyard. Then other systems, depending upon the type, might have these various inspection ports. And you can see in this case, there's several. This is actually two separate septic systems, uh, one over here, and then this is the backyard of another home. But you can see these inspection ports that are standing, you know, several feet tall. And again, how do you properly landscape those without interfering with the, the function of the system, but also allowing the service provider to be able to come out and, and inspect the system. So just to provide a couple of examples, these are photos from the web. You can see this one system here is a BAT unit with several access ports and they've near the house and they've simply just added various types of landscaping plants to, to uh, provide some, you know, some aesthetic value. Another example, more simplified example is here where they've used uh, flower pots on top of the access ports with a little stone and some other planting, again, just to break, break it up and provide some features. And in this particular case, we have a bird bath that on top of the access port with other plantings uh, and other decorations around that particular uh, access port. So again, just a, a variation of uh, the earlier one. And then here's a picture of a sand mound that has been planted with a variety of, of species of plants, but also providing some aesthetic value, some pollinator habitat, etc. Here's another example of a sand mound, um, not as tall as the one on the left, but nonetheless still a sand mound. And, and again, there's another technique. They've added some stone borders here. They've, they've used uh, pea gravel as the mulch. Again, um, that can be a good idea because it, it has plenty of air space in between the, the gravel. Um, and so it allows you know, good oxygenation down into the drain field. Then I saw another couple of examples online that I you know, wanted to point out some potential concerns here. So here's a sand mound, very attractive, uh, has you know, a multiple uh, species of plantings and then also some rock, again, uh, very aesthetically pleasing. One question I would have would be what type of species of trees 
are these and uh, how close are they to the mound and would the roots actually enter either the side of the mound or, or on top of the mound and uh, cause some damage to the piping, et cetera. So that would be one consideration. And then uh, consideration here, uh, and this is actually a, a drain field that's been uh, bordered, um, looks very nice, different types of, of um, pollinator plants. And then also they've used, uh, looks, appears to be oak mulch. And so the question that I would have would be how thick is that mulch and how compacted it is. Oftentimes you'll see with mulches, uh, particularly oak mulch, is over time it breaks down and you can actually see rainwater run off of it. And so if that, that's the case, that's telling, telling me that it's compacted and, and likely blocking airflow into the soil. And then this is a, uh, another picture of a, of a sand mound where they've actually built a retaining wall uh, adjacent to the sand mound and possibly even into the side slope of the sand mound, which would impact the uh, treatment capacity of the system. So that would be uh, a, a potential problem. And so again, you'd have to be sure that you don't disturb the complete layout of the drain field, whether it be you know a gravel drain field, a drip system, or, or sand mound. You don't want to infringe on that treatment area. So always good to have a plan. And this is just a, a one particular plan uh, from a publication out of Minnesota we're just to give you some ideas on how to landscape a system. One point here I would make is always remember repair area would be and how do you build that into the landscape and how do you landscape that repair area minimally so that several decades down the road when you need to use it, you're not having to tear up a lot of, of um, plants that you've spent money on and, and time and care and et cetera. So again, just uh, you have to think, think ahead because again, a drain field does have a, a life span of 30 plus or minus years dependent upon its use. And then here's a um, diagram sketch of, you know, how you might, where do you, where do you uh, put that sand mound in relation to the home and how can you landscape it? So I'd like to cover some basic practices of landscaping septic systems, some of the do's and don'ts, if you will. And if you're getting, if you have an existing drain field or you have a new home um, and you want to landscape your system, it's important to not do any sort of major tilling over the drain field. You can lightly kind of scratch the surface, scarify the surface only to kind of break it up uh, so that you can do planting, but you don't want to go deep. Uh, and anytime you're developing a plan, you want to be sure that you're sloping water drainage, whether that be from your gutters or from your neighbor's property, be sure that it's sloped away from the tank and the drain field. You, you don't want excessive water loading the system because it can actually overload the capacity of the soil to take, take the uh, wastewater. And if you do have a new drain field, it is a good idea if you're not ready to landscape um, with different types of plants, at least establish turf over it to prevent erosion and things like that. And then always leave room for the service for providers to come in and pump your tank or to service your BAT system or, or get, get access to the, the inspection ports. Very important. You don't want to have to have uh, major pruning or, or removing removal of landscape uh, in order for people to, to get access. This is key for any type of drain field. Do not drive over it. And if your landscaper is coming in, uh, be sure that they only use a compact track loader. You don't, don't want to use anything that has like a backhoe that has tires, for example, because tires do a lot of compaction and you don't want that. You want to you want a vehicle that spreads the weight of that unit over as much wide area. And that's why tracked vehicles uh, work so much better. And then you wanna avoid planting trees, as I mentioned before. Certain trees are very invasive in the roots and you wanna be sure that you're, if you're gonna plant trees, that you plant the right species and at the right distance away from your system. And then if you do have existing vegetation, 
and you're concerned that they may be getting close to your system, uh, root barriers uh, may work with some tree species. The, the thing about it is they have to be planted very deep because roots are amazing in, in where they'll go and how deep they'll go uh, to bypass any sort of obstruction to reach that water and, and nutrients. And then consider lower maintenance native species of plants that, that with shallow roots. And I've got some examples. So this is just uh, you know, again, a very short list of different types of species of plants to give you some ideas that, you know, you're not limited to just a turf. You can plant pollinator species as some of the pictures have shown. You can, you can do grasses, you can do ground covers. Um, meadow mixes, for example, work very well. And again, provide a lot of aesthetic value, uh, pollinator habitat, habitat for other wildlife in your, your landscape is very important. Uh, this is from the Maryland DNR site. This is an example of, of dry meadows. So for example, if you have a sand mound, these, this might be uh, some, some species of plants that you could consider. And then uh, so as far as selecting trees, uh, you can see from the list here that some are not recommended to anywhere near the drain field. And that's because of their, the invasiveness of the roots. The roots will travel long distances and grow fast and will penetrate um, gravel trenches, get into the, the, uh, the pipe and actually clog up the pipe, which would you know, create a, a, a failing drain field. Some species of plants here, you can see dogwoods, you know, um, you know, some of the cherries, for example, uh, can, can be a little bit better, but even in that case, you wanna plant them away from the drain field. And there's no, really a lot of research that, that talks about the distances. This was just a recommendation based on some observations over time. So again, you want to be careful with, with trees. That's, that's the important point to make. So some additional tips for landscaping systems. If you do have turf, uh, turf again works really well over a drain field because you are mowing on a regular basis and that mowing not only can stimulate growth, but it increases evaporation. Um, so it's taking up water, taking up nutrients. Uh, so turf actually works well. It's just, uh, again, not, uh, not as uh, aesthetically pleasing as, as uh, you know, additional plantings and varieties of species. If you do have turf, it's a good idea to wait a few days after a rain because when soil is wet, it compacts a lot. This is really important. We touched a little bit on it earlier, is be sure that you do not cover the drain field with any sort of hard structure, any of the weed fabrics, for example, or excessive mulch. That, that soil in the drain field needs to breathe. Uh, certainly you don't want to plant a vegetable garden near or over your system. Uh, again, uh, non-edible plants, you know, flowers, grasses, etc. cetera, um, because again, Dependent upon the type of drain field you have, um, uh, particularly if it's a drip system, even though wastewater it's designed to go uh, down, it can go horizontally. And if it's uh, a rainy season, that that uh, infiltration may be may be uh, diminished, and there's a there's a risk of potentially wastewater getting up uh, near the surface. And if you have plants, you know, picking that up, uh, you just wouldn't again, wouldn't want to um, introduce any additional risk. So uh, vegetable gardens and septic systems are not a good idea. And then if you, uh, no matter what you plant, uh, it's always a good idea to not only wear gloves, but you know, practice good sanitation uh, when working over your drain field. And then lastly, whatever you decide to plant over your drain field, remember not to irrigated excessively. It's important obviously to keep the plants uh, you know, growing and in good health, but you don't want excessive water over the drain field. Because again, your drain field is designed to treat a certain amount of wastewater per day. And if you have, uh, whether it's storm water or if you're you know, irrigating on a regular basis, you're, you're adding hydraulic load to the drain field. And if you're using your system a lot, you've got company or whatever the case may be, uh, it's possible 
that you can add so much water to the system that it's not able to infiltrate as, as, as it needs to. And therefore you may see experience some issues with slow draining sinks or tubs, et cetera. So with that, I'll leave you with a host of resources to tap into. Again, utilize your local health department to see uh, if they have a plan for your system. Uh, they can also provide some additional guidance on your septic system and possibly well if you have a drinking water well. So thank you.